Our last speaker is somebody without whom I would say a lot of people in this room may not be in this room without the contributions that he made. He's somebody who, at a period of time, emerged to articulate what was desperately needed for millions of working people, which was an alternative, a voice that said, politics is not this miserable thing. Politics does not have to be something which is only something you see when it's making your life worse, when it's attacking your terms and conditions, when it's something that is riven with the interests of big business and corporations. Politics can be something that you get active in, that you change, and that can change your life. This speaker disgracefully has not been made to feel welcome at the Labour Party conference this year. This speaker will always be welcome on a Tribune platform. Please welcome to the stage, Jeremy Corbyn MP. much for being here tonight. Ronan, thank you for your introduction and thank you for giving Tribune new birth, a new place and giving us fantastic hope and information. And as one who started reading Tribune in the 1960s, yes, it was around before me. It's even older than me. I used to go into WH Smith's in Newport, Shropshire. Don't joke about it. <laughs> Might not be there now, but it was there then. We were very proud of our Smith's store, if you don't mind. No jokes, thank you. <laughs> and I'd go in there and say, um, I've, they reserved Tribune for me. It, was the, uh, <laughs> it wasn't strictly necessary, because I don't think anybody else was trying to buy it. <laughs> But nevertheless, they very kindly reserved it. So there was this palaver every time I went in. I said, I've come to pick up the Tribune. And this guy would say, is the gentleman's Tribune in the store? <laughs> and then somebody would bring it out, you know, <laughs> like you bring out some that the cats brought in, you know. <laughs> Here's your paper, sir. And uh, Tribune was a place that the left in the Labour Party and left in society could challenge ideas, give expression to ideas, and it was always, as his tribute, an amalgamation of ideas, of art, of culture, of music, and above all, of hope and information, and giving inspiration to each other. And I'm gonna say a bit more about this later on. Unless we do something about the way in which uh, we communicate with each other, and we get control of some degree of media for us to get our message across yeah. with our own values, we're gonna face greater battles in the future, but I'll come back to that in a moment. But we are here in Brighton at party conference. I want to say a couple of things. First of all, personally, an enormous thank you. An enormous thank you to an awful lot of people that have been personally very kind and very supportive to me. Laura, to my sons, and to um, my local party, Islington North Party, and to comrades... <laughs> Yeah, I knew, I knew you'd be, I can't see you because of the light, but I knew you'd be here. Yes. That sounds just like B.C. Williams down there. Yeah. And to comrades all over the country who got together in 2015 to make a challenge on the economic direction of our country, of our movement, and of our party. And John McDonald, who's just spoken, was fundamental and instrumental in changing the whole economic narrative and economic debate. And that has changed forever. And I was really touched when 
the wonderful Financial Times, and at times it can be wonderful, <laughs> put in the middle of an article the change in the mood and discussion about austerity. In bringing that change about, we should compliment two people on different sides of the Atlantic, and they kindly mention Bernie Sanders and myself. Yeah. As that yeah. So it is, it is about those fundamental changes that we achieved, and I want to say a huge thank you to so many people and all the ideas that they brought forward and all the ideas they still bring forward and all that we have to do together because you bring people together with hope, with enthusiasm, with expectation and that way you cut across the cynicism of the right-wing media, the cynicism of political commentators who can only ever sort of do things by triangulation. They can never do things by the basis of principle. And I want to say a big personal thank you to Andy McDonald for the letter he's written today. For being, being a fantastic comrade for many years and for bringing forward a sensible, practical, publicly owned, publicly run principle for transport in the system all across this country before he went on to pick up the great work done by Laura Pidcock and others in developing, in developing an employment policy. And I also want to say a big thank you to Andy for taking me to Saltburn and giving me chips there. Absolutely brilliant. What a place. I recommend Trillium rallies in Saltburn with chips in the future. Yes. Of course. <laughs> Thank you. Um, conference ought to be the place where you debate policy. Where you come together and recognise the issues that are facing our people day in, day out. And the stress, the horror, the misery, the fear that's there in so many households. So what do we discuss? A rule change for a leadership election that isn't in the offing anyway. It was kind of strange, and it was like a huge diversion. It took all our energies away on, in the wrong direction. I'll tell you this, that uh, I have been in this party from the foundation of the campaign for Labour Party democracy. At a time when the Parliamentary Labour Party basically held all the cards and all the aces. And gradually, 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 that was chipped away, and yes, the Electoral College was a step forward because it was reducing the power of the Parliamentary Labour Party to a third. And then we moved on where one member, one vote came in and we had a popular ballot for things. And I think that is the right way to go. And what worries me is that all the rule changes being put forward do two things. One is they re-empower the Parliamentary Labour Party. Now, being a Labour MP, is a huge honour and a huge responsibility. But it should not and must not give you control over what the party is and what the party does. But I'm also concerned at the numbers of members that receive letters of investigation that are suspended, that their cases hang around for a very long time, and the stress that they go through. I've talked to members, people who've been in the party all their lives, who are told that some retrospective rule has come in, that a letter they signed before the rule came in rendered them ineligible to be a member of our party. I think we need to think very, very carefully. People join political parties, hopefully, because they want to do some good, they want to bring the collective strength together of a party to achieve political change. They don't join it in order to become part of a bureaucratic machine. Surely our party has to be a movement, and that is why one of the things that I was most keen on and most determined to achieve when I became leader of the party was to set up a community organising unit so our party... So our party was... 
organising in communities all the time on the day-to-day -day issues and struggles that people face. Yeah. So that if your local nursery is under threat or needs expanding, your hospital is under threat or whatever needs changing there, or your park is in a bad state and should not be so, and all the other issues. Or if the local factory is on strike or people are trying to get uh, union recognition in that place, and that is a huge issue. And by the way, please all support the Uber workers tomorrow when they take action. <laughs> that community role for the Labour Party akin to what the Workers' Party in Brazil and others has a, have achieved, gives us that basis in all of our communities to legitimately turn up three weeks before an election. You're going to vote for us. That is the time to ask for a vote when they've seen you there with them, day to day, on all the battles that people face in life. But the issues... The issues that communities all across the country face at the present time, the growing levels of poverty, the huge levels of inequality, the widening, yawning, massive gap between the richest and poorest in our society, the growth of billionaires, and there is no crisis that doesn't create billionaires, but billionaires from the wars, billionaires from poverty, and billionaires out of COVID. Thank you, Tory government handing out contracts to all their mates to enrich them during the COVID crisis. These are the issues. These are the issues that have to be faced. These are the issues that have to be faced. And the uh, fear over the cut in universal credit, the fear over the insufficiency of statutory sick pay, the fear of rent levels growing up, the fear of an unregulated private rented market, the fear of young people with massive debts because they had the temerity to want a college or university education. We can deal with all those issues. Yeah. We can do it by investment. We can do it by development. We can do it by mobilizing people. And we do it and pay for it by taxing the unaccountable, untrammeled power of the wealthiest within our society. And so, these massive issues have to be faced. But I say this, I've been on demonstrations, picket lines and so on, outside hospitals all over this country, all of my life. And I will always do that. I will defend the NHS till the last breath I breathe, because it is one of the greatest socialist advances ever made. Healthcare free at the point of need as a human right. But it's under threat, it's under attack, that we all know. And so, in campaigning to defend the NHS, let's also be positive and say we want a fully publicly owned NHS. Yes. And if the NHS cannot cope with the backlog of um, elective surgery operations and so much else at the moment, which it is having great difficulty doing, then they say, well, people are going to private medicine in order to get operations. Now, I understand the, the problems and fears that people go through. Isn't that the perfect moment, the absolutely perfect moment to say, well, folks, we have these health facilities all over the country. Yeah. Yeah. Take them over yeah. and put them in the NHS. Yeah. So that those facilities are available for all people that need them. And at the same time, we've gone through this whole stuff about care. Well, carers are some of the most skilled, responsible yeah. people that we have within our society. <laughs> our loved ones, elderly relatives, younger people who've got profound difficulties and problems rely on, the, on care workers to look after them. Talk to care workers about the stress of their lives, the 15-minute appointments, not being paid between going, going between appointments. 
not getting a sleepover allowance when they've got to look after somebody. Going back to their clients, patients, after they've finished work because they're so concerned about them and not even being paid to do that. All done on minimum wage. It is disgusting and disgraceful. Surely, instead of going through the proposals on raising national insurance, which uh, are not universal, not fairly distributed, fall unfairly on people who should not be forced to pay anymore. Let's instead campaign, just as the Labour Party did in the 1930s and 40s for a national health service, campaign for a national care service. Yeah. Free, free at the point of need and pay for good general taxation. These issues mean that you have to actually confront power structures in our society. We have to recognise that if we want to achieve the social justice for everybody, then it does require taxing the very richest, it does require the redistribution of power and wealth, and yes, it does require public ownership of mail, of rail, of water, of energy. And, and following the industrial policies put forward by Becky and by John and Andy and others, we committed ourselves to the uh, empowerment of workers to be represented in their companies, to have a right to take over a failing company, and for the funding for the establishment of cooperatives. A fundamental empowerment of the working class of this country. That was the whole point behind those policies. And we should never shy away from them, we should never apologise for them, we should actually be very, very proud of those policies. And then, those are just some of the issues that so many people face within our society. Those suffering because of the way in which uh, the disabled are badly treated, discriminated against, young black people discriminated against, and not gaining the best they could, Islamophobia, anti-Semitism, any other form of racism is totally unacceptable in any shape, way or form within our society and it's the labour movement that brings people together in all our diversity to recognise why we have to fight these things and I will be in Cable Street next week commemorating commemorating when Jewish and Irish workers came together to confront the fascists who were trying to march through the East And we will be joined by very large numbers of people from the Muslim community in the area as well. That is what Labour movement solidarity can do and can achieve. We live in a world of a crisis. The crisis of climate change, the crisis of pollution, the crisis of the loss of biodiversity, of natural habitats and natural spaces. And we have COP26 coming up. I don't know what's going to come out of COP26, but I'm quite fearful that it will be, um, how should I put it, globally, corporately sponsored greenwash that could come out of it, which won't add up to very much. The reality is, it's the poorest people in the poorest places, in the poorest countries, as well as the richest countries, who breathe, breathe the foulest air, drink the worst quality water, have the worst quality health service, have the shortest life expectancy, and are the first ones in line to suffer from climate change and global warming. It is grossly unequal. There has to be a way forward, which isn't about redistributing power and wealth in the wrong way, but it's recognising the class issue that is there in environmental politics as well. And when, around the Shadow Cabinet table, we discussed the Green Industrial Revolution, Becky Long-Bailey led the charge on it, and she said, quite rightly, if it's not acceptable to the people I represent in Salford, 
or any other industrial part of this country, it's not going to happen and it's not acceptable. Yeah. We have to environmentally change our way of thinking and our industries, our transport systems, heating systems and everything else by investment, by creating jobs, by skilled work, but above all, by trade union action at the workplace to make their place more environmentally sustainable. That is why I ask you to be part of the demonstrations on the November the 5th in the workplace and November the 6th on the streets of London, and then there's obviously going to be huge events going on in Glasgow, where I hope the people from the Global South are heard. I hope those from Bangladesh and the islands in the Indian Ocean are heard, and those that are suffering so much are properly heard. That surely has to be the right way forward. But what is actually happening on the global stage at the present time? We've had the war in Iraq. We've had the war in Syria. We've had the war in Libya. We've had the war in Afghanistan. And we have a war going on in Myanmar. Yeah. We have 70 million refugees around the world. Refugees from war, from famine, from climate change, from human rights abuse, from dictatorships. And those 70 million people all want to lead their lives, all want to live and survive somehow with their place in the world. When the history books are written, about the 21st century. They'll say, what was going on when those people were so desperate to survive that Europe put up barbed wire around the continent, that Britain sent boats out into the channel to deter them, and racist abuse was heaped upon them, and the poorest countries in the world housed the largest number of refugees. There are one million Rohingya refugees in Bangladesh, for example. And there are many other countries in the world that are housing very large numbers of refugees. So cannot we find it somewhere to lead with a human heart and a human face towards these people rather than describing them as enemies and threats as have been done at the present time? So it is about an international strategy that's based on peace, on justice, on human rights. It is about an international strategy that's worthy of the name. But what have we got in the past week? The Australia-UK-US Pact. Now, what on earth is that about? I'm old enough to remember opposing the Vietnam War in the 1960s. And the realisation by the then British government of Harold Wilson, with whom I profoundly disagreed on Vietnam, but there was another point that he made that was a very important one, that Britain, as a post-imperial power, could not afford a global role. Hence, all forces were withdrawn from east of Suez. What Boris Johnson has done is put us back into being a global role, and if you were in Parliament or listening to Parliament on the day it was recalled in August to discuss the situation in Afghanistan, there were MPs getting up saying, well, if the Americans won't get stuck in and really boot the Chinese, we'll do it. <laughs> Hang on a minute. We are 65 million people on the northwest coast of Europe in a world of many, many billions. Does it make any sense for us to developing us to be developing a new generation of nuclear weapons, a new global role for ourselves, at the same time as increasing arms expenditure by 24 billion and cutting overseas aid expenditure, underfunding local government, underfunding national health service, cutting benefits to people. Where are the human priorities in this? I want to live in a world of peace. I want to create a world of peace. We don't do that by this endless preparation for war. And that's why Conference is so right to challenge this whole strategy. And I will be supporting and be there, I hope, at the Nuclear Non-Proliferation Treaty Review Conference, which we signed many, many decades ago, which committed us as a country 
to take steps towards nuclear disarmament. The steps we're taking are in the wrong direction by increasing the number of nuclear warheads. Listen, a nuclear war would finish the whole planet off. Everybody knows that. So surely that is the time to join the global ban on nuclear weapons, which the majority of countries have signed. The arms trade is a very powerful lobby force. And we were in Liverpool opposing the arms fair, the electronic arms fair being held there, and many in London opposed the arms fair in London. And that arms trade is lucrative, and arms dealers do all kinds of shady stuff. And I want us to help the people of Yemen. I fully support the overseas aid that goes to Yemen to help children get through, and so on. I support all of that. But why, oh why? Are we providing the weapons to Saudi Arabia in the first place that bomb Yemen that brings about that disaster that those children are facing? So it is about confronting that. Now, all of these issues that we talked about here this evening and all the issues that we all care passionately about have to be argued for, have to be campaigned for, and they do challenge a very powerful set of assumptions in our world. That's why it's so important when we heard earlier fantastic, fantastic speech from Nina from the United States and everything that she said that she's put forward. And I had the pleasure earlier on of an hour-long conversation with her. It's been recorded, it's okay, you'll all see it if you want to. And it was wonderful because we talked about how people are mobilised and how young people particularly are mobilised all around the world. And that means we have to mobilise for hope. But it also means we have to have some way of communicating with each other. Tribune, with its message here, was set up a very long time ago in the 1930s. It was set up in order to uh, make sure the voice of socialism, the voice of the left, could be heard. We now have very powerful media. We have the Murdoch Empire, we have all the other media empires. We also have the Facebook, the Google, the YouTube empire as well. And like all empires, they get a bit nervous at times and they have great power. So when the Indian farmers needed to communicate with each other, needed that chance to talk to each other at a crucial time in their campaign against the new agricultural law in India, what happened? Every single bit of their electronic communication was shut down and closed off. Shame. That Shame. is what untrammeled power does when working class people try to communicate with each other. Yeah. Just as Tribune was set up to be a voice for socialists, the Morning Star, so many other papers, Canary, Double Down News, Squawk Box, all the others that are there in order to give that voice. We need to bring those forces together. We need our own access to TV. We need our own access to radio. Above all, we need that ability to talk to each other. And the one thing COVID has taught us is that it's perfectly possible to have a very good meeting without even leaving your living room <laughs> online. Now, OK, we all get a bit zoomed out at times, a bit fed up with it. But it has meant that people who for good reason cannot get out and go to meetings from distance, for disability, care, whatever their issue is, have been able to be part of our movement. Now I should imagine pretty well everybody in this hall is involved in political activity in some way or the other. Can I just make this little plea to you? As you organise meetings as the months go on, and more and more are held physically rather than virtually, don't forget those that can't come. Have a hybrid meeting. Have a hybrid meeting so that others can take part in it and we don't isolate and disempower people. We live in a time of crisis. We live in a time of immense danger to this world and to our own, the fabric of our own society. Are we to hand that space over to the political right? Are we to allow the far right to get a message that somehow or other the only thing you have to do is hate your neighbour, hate somebody, hate somebody else, no. because that way you'll make yourself feel all right? Or do we get that message out 
that it's only people and communities coming together. It's only the principles of socialism that can actually deal with these issues and that we should be unashamed of our past, of our history and of our, term our determination to bring about that fundamental change in the world. And so it is all about confidence and hope. Now, not being in office is a lot worse than being in office, obviously. If you're in office and you've got a control of a council, of a parliament, anywhere in the world, you can try and do something. You can achieve things. Matt Brown was talking earlier about the stuff he's achieved. Yes, you can. But you're not a god, you're not infallible, and you're not superhuman. It is the strength of movements that bring about change. The Civil Rights Act in the United States didn't come about because of the genius of individuals in the Senate or the House. It came about from the bravery of people in Alabama and all those southern states that stood up. The trade union movement in Britain wasn't founded because the House of Commons thought it would be a nice and fair idea. It was founded by the hardship of those that sacrificed all in order to found the trade union movement. So when we go out there doing our campaigning, above all, be strong for each other. Give each other confidence, support and hope. Hope is where we are, hope is what we offer and hope is what we will achieve for a better world, a better society and a fairer country in a peaceful world. Thank you very much.